Good afternoon or good evening. Uh, welcome to my guest lecture about machine learning in action. I'm from Germany. My institute is located exactly in this area. Looks a bit, a little bit devastated. Uh, doesn't look like machine learning, but that's a field where we apply machine learning. Uh, what you can see here is the National Park Bavarian Forest that converts now for 50 years from a classical forestry, mainly needle trees planted there, to some mixed structures. And one of the reasons why it looks like this is a little beetle, the so-called bark beetle. He drills underneath the bark, takes the fluid from the tree, kills the tree, and in the national park, of course, that's a natural result. We get a mixed forest structure. But next to the national park is the old forest, also needle trees, and the bark beetle has one very sad, stupid thing. He can fly, he can swarm, and he starts to kill also the trees outside the national park. Well, it's quite bad for forestry and causes significant damages. Especially now during this time of the year, this year, climate change has a major impact. The drought during the last years has reduced the ability of trees to defend against this bark beetle. And the big question is always, where does he start to spread? Where does he fly? And where will be next year's infection? And what we are currently developing, and that's one example of machine learning, um, is we use remote sensing data from drones, the signature that we get from pictures, from aerial photos, and we try to find combinations where this individual spectral information goes in parallel with the infection of trees through the bark beetle. And so we try to make some kind of a prediction of an early warning system based on drones and machine learning. But maybe first, uh, where are we from? What, what are we doing? Who are we? Um, I'm head of the Institute of Applied Informatics. We are 40 scientists at the in Institute, about 10 to 15 students working with us. It's a research institute, and we are doing applied research. So most of our research, almost 80%, is always research in combination with practitioners from some industry where we bring in our expertise from computer science, our research background in computer science, and combine it with the expertise from some application domain to develop new technologies and new products out of scientific finding. So our task is to support companies in the region to become more competitive on a global market, develop new products, or get from engineering, classical engineering companies, into R&D and technology-driven companies to support this conversion. Um, we have several research teams. These are our core areas where we are working. So we are in software development. That's my main specialization, spatial temporal modeling, working with large amounts of spatial and temporal data, like satellite or drone data. Uh, we have one group also in AI and high performance computing. We are doing signal and radio analysis. Um, so we have a broad mix mixture of electrical engineering, software engineering, classical computer science at our institute. And uh, not limited number of application areas are here round. These are not areas of specialization that we have. These are our partners from industry with whom we cooperate that bring into our institute their expertise from a specific domain. So for instance, I have nobody who's a specialist in forestry or biology. But we closely cooperate with the National Park, with biologists from a university to get this expertise and to apply software technologies, computer technologies in these domains. Um, in the beginning of the lecture, I would like to show you three examples um, how this technology transfer and cooperation looks like, sm three small short samples covering almost all of the fields. And then I have one or two examples of how to apply machine learning. So it will not be about, about machine learning, but how to use it and what maybe are sometimes the obstacles. Um, am I sufficiently loud for you back there in the last row and is my English convenient for you? Yes. Am I too fast? Slower? Okay, I have to slow down. Thank you. Um, some examples. This is a server system manufactured by Thomas Krenn. Thomas Krenn is the third largest server manufacturer in Germany. Number one is Dell, number two is HP, and number three is Thomas Krenn. But they are mainly an engineering company, which means they receive components, 
Then there are some standards how to build a server. Then they manufacture the server and that's it. And engineering is mainly about how to integrate new components. So for instance, if there is a trend in GPU, then the question is how to build the server in total with all the components that you can do CPU as well as GPU. And Thomas Krenn received a challenge by German Center for Aerospace Research. That's German NASA Space Agency. If you take such a regular server system, then approximately 70 to 80 percent of the costs are runtime costs for energy. So it's not so expensive to buy a server, but over a two-year period to operate it and get all the energy. And 60 to 70 percent of this energy is for cooling, because air ventilated cooling is very inefficient. So what was the challenge by German space agency? Um, develop a server system based on classical Intel x64 architecture, so no special processors, and integrate a water-based cool, water cooling system that is able to cool down the processor at a range of approximately between 45 and 70 degrees Celsius. Of course, this technology is available for high-performance computing. You will find one, the SuperMOOC in Munich, uh, which is one in the top 100 list of supercomputers, water-cooled. But they bought special IBM CPUs that have a range beyond 70 degrees Celsius. And they are twice as expensive as the regular x64 architecture. So our task was, together with Thomas Krenn, to get them from a classical engineering process into an R&D process where research results from computer science, sensor technology, data fusion from individual sensors, um, thermodynamics, or the temperature measurements, and interpret them together with material science. What is the best material you can use for such a cooling corpus you could place up there, together with um, system engineering for buildings to use the warm water at the end to heat the building. This was the task list. So and what you can see at the end, here is a completely new system that we engineered and designed together with the company. Um, first big difference, it's water cooled. That was what we'd like to achieve. Second, um, you can use it in such a kind of a design rack, for instance, and immediately place it in an office shop, office floor, because there is no noise anymore. It's calm. You won't hear anything, so you can use it in any environment. Because you don't need any, water, uh, any air supply, you can lock it, completely seal it. You only need water in, water out, data in, data out, and electricity in. So you can place it in a rough environment, such as a fabrication environment, a plant, a factory, because you don't have any problems with dust anymore. And um, it's fully rack mountable, and it uses um, 30 to 40 percent less space than classical um, air-cooled systems, which means per unit of space in a computing center, you can have 30 percent more computing capacity. So it's only the equation space versus computing capacity. So this was for a small company in our area. They have something like 250 employees. Another project was for the big ones, uh, BMW, the electricity development, electric vehicle fleet. Uh, we ran three projects for BMW. One was in the initial phase where BMW manufactured this Mini E which is the Mini Cooper, but fully electrified with battery technology. And there we did the spatial analysis. So we monitored a fleet of electric vehicles and analyzed the behavior of people, how people change their behavior of driving, how to use a car in the comparison of classical combustion engine before electric vehicle in between, and then again combustion engine. So what does it make in people's mind if they have reduced distance they could cover. They have charging processes in between. And it was surprising for BMW, um, test areas where Hong Kong, San Francisco, New York, Munich, Berlin, Degendorf, 35,000 inhabitants. The most successful and the most significant changes in driving behavior were in our area. Because here people mainly rely on motors, on cars which meant a favorite region for electric vehicles is not the city, 
but it's the rural space. We did further projects where we developed um, hardware technology bus components for BMW that are now integrated in the i3 series and the i8 series and will be integrated also in the current 5 and new 7 series BMW, which is for efficiency of the network system. You can imagine 20% of energy of an electric vehicle is consumed by the car electronics. Navigation, entertainment, cooling, air condition, which means reducing this consumption is a significant contributor to extend the range of such a vehicle. And last but not least, that's a current project we are doing together with Calix from Health Science. Um, it's about ambient assisted living because we have an aging population in Germany, people get older, and the question is always how to care about old people if especially the young ones go to the city. I think in Ukraine it's similar. In rural areas, the younger ones are leaving, going to the city to study, don't come back. The older ones stay at home, and sometimes they get sick, they get old, they get lazy. The question is how to help them, and the question is what can digital technology inside a house by Google Home, Amazon's Alexa, sensors for light, sensors for movement, sensors for health parameters like heartbeat, etc., support families in such a situation. Um, our role as computer scientists is on the one hand side to consult health science because in some cases they are already at the edge of their knowledge if they should install an Alexa or a Google Home. So we have to do classical installation tasks. But the major question is interdisciplinary. Where are the gaps in the technology? Because Google Home was never made for elderly people. It was made for consumers. And the question is, what is necessary as a technology to refurniture a home that old people can stay longer at home, enhance the costs for medical supply, for care, personal care, individualized care, can be reduced because that's a large cost block that will come in the future. We are also operating on an international level. Uh, we are in the US with an MBA program and with our entrepreneurship program. We have currently a lot of projects around South America uh, where we apply our technologies in combination with partners from Chile, Argentine and Colombia. We have an excellent cooperation, as Mikola already mentioned, with Ukraine based on ATSIT and now our cooperation agreement. And now I would like to introduce you to two machine learning projects um, to show you what are the current challenges. The projects will not be so much about the theory of machine learning behind and what to do, but what obstacles can come up in a process if you think you can do machine learning and then you get into some obstacle that has nothing to do with machine learning. First is a project that is funded by our National German Minister for Transportation and Digital Infrastructure. It's called Wilda. Um, maybe about the background. Here you can see our former minister and two young former students of mine. And they had one event four years ago. They crashed with the car on the way from the university into a wild deer, a wild animal on the street. And what do them computer scientists do if they have such a kind of accident? They think what can computer technology do to avoid such a situation? And what they developed was on a statistical basis the first warning app for car drivers to get warnings in specific situations where there is an increased risk for such accidents. Um, they received data from our Bavarian ministry, they collected data now for 10 years almost. Um, so they have hundreds of thousands of data sets of individual car crashes where a car smashed into a wild animal. If we look at the relevance of this problem in the beginning, it looks quite individual. Well, unfortunately, I smashed into a deer. But if we look into the problems behind, there is currently no proper solution to protect against these um, accidents except fences and they are very costly. And if we look at the numbers in Germany, every second minute, statistically, on an annual basis, there is somewhere inside Germany such an accident. And if we look into further numbers, these accidents accumulate up to more than half a billion euros of insured costs. These are only insured cars. There are situations where it's not reported, 
There are the damages to the wildlife. So a lot of impacts, if we sum it up, we are far beyond 1 billion euro economic damage due to this type of accidents. And numbers are increasing. If we look now at the situation of these accidents, this is a neighboring district, um, and we can see here the density uh, and the probability of accidents for individual spots on a road. And if you look at this, it seems like there is an accident can happen almost everywhere. But that's not exactly true, because we are disregarding several components. We are just looking on a spatial component, and already here we can see there are significant hotspots in there. Second question, spatial, temporal, are there some temporal patterns? And if you look here, for instance, at one small section here, it's a small motorway, um, we have during summer period, all accidents spread along the motorway. If you go into winter period, all accidents with deers only happen between forests. So there are significant changes over the year. And if we go into the statistics, then we have here in green, bird of prey, so wild birds, hunting birds, and we have wild boar. And we have here spring, summer, autumn, winter, and as we can see, bird accidents mainly happen in spring. That's significant. While wild boar accidents mainly happen in summer and autumn, and especially during night, not during the day. So there are spatial temporal patterns that might help to predict accidents. So what was our idea? How to apply machine learning? Behind these patterns must be specific reasons. So for instance, these are wildlife specific. Animals show different types of behavior depending on the day, the time of the day, and the day of the year. That's one aspect, the type of animal. But if we look into more detail, then maybe also other aspects like solar iteration, fog, the climate condition, the weather condition during the time of the accident, the vegetation and the land use, boars like potatoes, which means potatoes are attractive if there are potatoes and if they are available to them so they can harvest them. Topography, the road network itself, of course, the accident location, and then also road parameters like the size of the road, the frequency of the traffic, etc. Currently, we looked into literature and we found that a lot of scientists, especially from biology, took some accident data and did some statistical correlations. And they combined accidents with land use, or they combined accidents with the weather conditions. But nobody tried to do more than two parameters in parallel. First, because of a lack of data, there is not sufficient accident data available. And second, it's quite difficult from a statistic perspective with classically descriptive statistics to combine more than two parameters. So it's a lack of data and it's a lack of methods. And that's where our idea came into place to take a neural network to feed in all these parameters into the neural network to use the past accidents to train it and predict the probability or the occurrence of an accident at a specific place, at a specific time of the day, now or in the future. So this was the challenge. Um, looking now at the data, we came exactly to this point um, where we had to derive from our classical path because we ran into the same trap as scientists before. You can't do any machine learning, etc., if you don't have sufficient data. Um, and one important issue was, as you can see it here, fences. Fences have a high impact because they hinder wild animals to go on the street. So if there is a fence, there shouldn't be an accident in those cases. Second, crash barriers. Nobody looked at crash barriers in the past. And there came now the question for us, why? Because there is no data about crash barriers available. No German country, nor other European countries, had data about the location of crash barriers and fences. And this is where we had to derive from our classical methodology and again go into machine learning 
because now our question was how to get this data. And uh, here we had some idea in Bavaria and in Germany the state administration does something similar to Google. They're just running with a car along the street and they're taking pictures. And this was the point where I said, if Google is able to analyze images, photo images, to detect objects inside, why shouldn't we be able to take these pictures and identify fences and crash barriers? So what we did was uh, to apply machine learning. In this case, we used the pre-trained neural network, which is called Inception 3. It's pre-trained with 1.2 million images as a data set, and it provides 1,000 categories classified data. Um, so if you have, for instance, the question, is in the image a street, then this neural network, if you use it and feed it with an image, can tell you with a 97% probability whether on this image is a street or not. So the failure rate is around 3%. We have uh, 48 layers, the past training data set. Um, what we had from our side was uh, 5,500 images, not sufficient for machine learning, um, for a highway network of 113 kilometers. But this was only for testing our methodology. Um, and we applied now our data, our 5,000 images, to this neural network. And what we did is in machine learning a little trick. Um, if you have a net, a neural network that is already trained but lacks some specific aspects. So for instance, in this data set, the classification scheme fence and crash barrier was missing. Then you can use um, a training approach that you take your neural network, cut off the last layer and you do transfer learning which means you take a pre-trained network that was not perfectly trained for your purpose, but should be suitable because it's all about images. And then you retrain the network at the end with, in this case, new categories, fence and um, crash barrier. So we took our data, that's a classical approach. You have take your data, you do 80% training data, that's what you use for training the network, for retraining it. So you feed this 80% into your neural network. Then you have your validation data, which means for every run of the network during the training phase, you have a data set of 10% where the network exactly knows what is in the image, with or without. So the neural network during the training can compare its network result against a predefined image that is known and can say, yes, I'm as a network, I'm already ready and I can stop learning because I can detect everything or I haven't been able to detect it, so I have to rerun the training process and start learning again to start a new learning cycle. And then at the end, if everything is finished, you have 10% of your data for testing everything, which means you have the, pre the trained network that ran through several cycles, hundreds of training cycles, and then you let your network run against the test data set, about 10% of the data, um, to see what the result is now from a statistical perspective, what the detection classification quality of the network is. Well, um, we decided to use the front left and front right image uh, for one reason, because it's important to know at which side of the street the crash barrier offense is. If you go for a front image like this here, we have crash barriers on both sides. So we cannot distinguish between left and right. But that's important. Um, if you take the front left image, we can immediately say if it's front left and he's driving in that, that direction, then we know it's the left hand side of the street with regard to the direction of the street. What is now the process inside? We amended it a little bit to increase the quality. First is we have an um, image that is handed over to the network. And then if with a probability of larger than 50%, there is no fence or no crash barrier, we just let it go. But on the other hand side, if there is a crash barrier on it, then it will go into this process and it will run into a GIS geo information system where we take the image, the coordinates of the image, and then we will see whether we have neighboring 
points, neighboring images, to have not only one point for a crash barrier, but to take the stationing, the location of the image, and combine several images to reconstruct the fence over the space or to reconstruct uh, the crash barrier over the space. And this looks at the end like this. So we get for every image point the information, true or false, crash barrier, no crash barrier, and we can make a linear information out of it. What is the extent, the full extent of the crash barrier? Well, what were the results? Um, for crash barriers, looks quite good. Here in the first round with a small amount of data, only 5,000 images, in comparison to 1.2 million images of training data for the basic net, uh, we had a probability of 80%. But here we had a problem if we took faces less than 65% detection probability. So a very high failure. And the question now was, where does this failure come from? Um, looking at the images, um, then we have here the situation, crash barriers, left and right, the left, left and right images result in similar results, roughly 80%. Looking at the fences, there is a significant difference between right images and left images. Have you any idea why? It's an automatic photo system, so it's mounted on the top of the car. So it's no, not a person taking the photo, it's mounted on the top of the car, but you're heading in the right direction. What was your further point? Your further point, the driver on the... The driver is driving on the right-hand side of the street. And what is the consequence? Sorry. Uh, the guards that are heading forward could like, uh, be an obstacle to take a photo. There could be obstacles. And the, the most obvious thing, obstacle, is one important point, and the second issue is resolute, yeah? So, sorry, again, the... It's closer. It's closer to the car, which means the resolution inside the images is much higher. So you have a higher resolution. So if we look at this side here, the car is driving on the right-hand side of the street, taking a picture of the left-hand side. You can't even see the mesh. And then there is a second thing. Can you imagine what could disturb a machine learning system, a neural network, if he has to identify a fence in this image? You can't see the mesh of the fence. Do you see any similarities between a fence and something else in this image? There is something similar. <coughs> Different types of fences. Here is one fence. And what is this here? It's a tree. Does it look like a fence post? For human, not. But for the machine. It's white, it's a linear horizontal structure. It's quite similar, it's di disturbing the system. Um, second point is here, you can see it in the landscape. Fence posts can be identified. Back here we have additional posts uh, next to trees to stabilize the tree while growing it up. So that's always disturbing the system. And at the end of the day, can you see the fence on this image? Icon 2, that's the geometry. It's hidden behind here, the wall, and on the other hand side here behind the crash barrier because it's at the bottom um, of, the, of the road um, dam. So it can't be seen. While crash barriers are always along the street, fences can be and have a distance of 10, 20, 30 meters aside from the seat, which means they are even not on the image. So, um, at the end, we came out uh, with these results here from road intersections for crash barriers and for fences. And what we did in addition was we used probability 
analysis, how probable is it that he will identify one image with a crash barrier offense, and then on the next two or three images, there is no crash barrier offense. Fences and crash barriers always cover longer sections of a street, which means we can identify individual failures, a gap inside a crash barrier where he wasn't able to identify something, or a crash barrier where before and afterwards there's no crash barrier due to these little mistakes if we apply spatial analysis. So, um, one point that you mentioned already was the different types of fences because a fence in the train system is a game fence as well as a garden fence, a pasture fence, um, or railings of a bridge. They are disturbing, which means we need more data and a more diversified classification because the starting classification, just fence or no fence, is insufficient for our purposes. Second, the image resolution is an important point. That's what we are working on currently because ImageNet requires a resolution of 299 times 299 pixels. The original resolutions of the images we have is 1200 to 800. So we have already a significant loss of information due to the reduced size of the images we can feed to the net. Second, what we did was uh, currently we are going in not into image classification but into object detection. That's also a main difference while working with photos. Before, the algorithm was just looking at the picture and telling us there is a fence or there's no fence. In the next step is object detection. He tells us not only is there a fence or not, but what are the significant markers, for instance, fence post, and he can mark us in the image where he detected the fence and which object he recognized, which we can apply later on also for advanced analysis and filtering techniques to filter out false positive or positive false. And last step was what I mentioned, um, this spatial analysis which we applied, which means um, if I have such an area without any fence. And then I have here and here a fence post. Then this normally is a mistake in the data set, a false classification, because fences cover a longer area. The same whole happens also vice versa if we have a longer track and we have in between, um, we have all over the track a fence, fences and then there's immediately one point in a 20 meter section where there is no fence detected. That's a misdetection, a failure of the system. So we can filter this out. So where are we going from there? Um, now we are back with our wildlife vehicle collisions. Um, we used also our neural network and fed it with all this data, including accidents and now also road infrastructure. And currently, with a small data set, we are able uh, to predict wildlife vehicle collisions in a 100 meter raster, spatial 100 meter raster, for a one hour daily period with a probability of 70%. Um, we had the idea also to include traffic. And this was an, a significant learning for us. Uh, we received from the German Automotive Club floating car data. That is data that gets recorded by different systems, for instance your smartphone, and provides for a two minute resolution for every second minute your exact coordinate, speed, acceleration, and everything you need how you are moving. And we received a data set of 2 billion data points for one year period. Sounds great. Big data. But it has a problem. If we use this data for the state of Bavaria, it's um, 12 million inhabitants, rural area. And if we take a one year period and make a one hour resolution, and then we distribute it over the area for a 100 meter grid. We have less than one data point for a grid cell of 100 times 100 meter 
for a four hour period. You can make the calculus easily, which means what in the first instance looks like big data is at the end, if you take a spatial and temporal distribution, only a very small data set. So currently we cannot work with traffic data because the only provider that could provide sufficient data is Google or Apple because they collect all of our data so they know exactly where we are and what we are doing. Currently I'm in touch with Google because I have a friend there so we are trying to get some data but currently traffic data is out of scope because big data is insufficient to do big data and machine learning in a traffic application if you're not Google. What is the result? Um, this application will be updated end of the year and uh, they will change. It's a startup, three students from our university. Um, they are currently also in contact with a large German car manufacturer to integrate this warning system into the car navigation system, which means in the future, if you're entering the car, he will automatically provide you a warning if you, come in a, if you will come in a situation where there's a higher probability of a, a car accident. Um, currently, we are looking for extensions of the project. Of course, traffic data I mentioned, that's the big gap. We don't know anything about traffic because there's insufficient data. We also would like to extend it. So we would like to go to other areas so if you see that this is an interesting topic for you and you maybe have some data from the Ukraine or forever over the world, uh, it would be a great pleasure to discuss with you maybe the extension of our project to other areas, to other regions and maybe also as a potential collaboration between us and your institution, your university. Okay, any questions on this example? Please some questions about this. Exactly. Yes, that's uh, the current challenge. Currently, it's a smartphone app. You can download it in uh, Google's Play Store or in iTunes App Store uh, from Apple. Have it as a smartphone app. It combines. Uh, it connects also with Bluetooth. So the app exactly knows when you're in your car because you're connected and then we'll start the warning. Um, but this is a problem. We had long discussions also with the German police how to make it safe. I don't know how it is in Ukraine, but in Germany you are not allowed to operate a smartphone in your hand. It should work automatically. You can have a phone call. Um, you can have it placed in the windshield as you have seen before on my initial uh, image, but you are not allowed to have it in the hand. So what the, the application is doing, um, it's vibrating and it's giving a noise. So somebody is telling you in this area is an increased risk of wildlife vehicle collisions. It's a famous moderator from a, a German radio station who is uh, telling this. He's also telling the, the traffic news. So we have taken a convenient and well-known voice uh, to give this warning. But the next step will be uh, to get into cars and to integrate it in either smartphone based navigation systems that can feed it then through Google Auto and Apple CarPlay into the classical onboard system or to be even available in the onboard system of a large OEM like BMW, Volkswagen, etc. This will work for the next year. It can be used without connection to the car. It will work autonomously based on your current GPS position measured by the smartphone. This uh, car connection is a convenience functionality because you, have, you don't have to care about is it active or not, should I start the service. Um, if the system identifies the Bluetooth connection with the car, then the system will automatically go into this um, monitoring and warning mode and present you warnings. Currently, we have a user basis of 50,000 users that are active. Um, the big problem is um, you can't calculate the um, effectiveness of such a system because you would need the data about avoided accidents. But what we did as a mean of verification of the system, uh, we integrated hunters. 
So in Germany we have the system as a private person. I can apply for a hunting license for my own territory or I can get a hunting license for some public or private territory and then I'm responsible for hunting, controlling population of animals as well as handling accidents. So if an accident happens, the hunter will be called to handle the wounded or dead animal. And we have now a group of currently something like 1,200 hunters, licensed hunters with their area, and they feed into the system their accidents and their hotspots, and also give feedback on um, the warning system, because if you have an accident, then you can immediately call through the system the hunter. So if you are in an area where the hunter is registered with the system, you don't have to call the police or call somebody to get information who is the responsible hunts person, but then you will, can call immediately the hunts person and he will find the place immediately where the accident happened. So this is some process. And there we received feedback also from the hunters um, that first the estimation of the locations and the statistical data we use is uh, properly and second, that in some areas after two years of operation, they have in, in some areas reduced um, numbers of accidents. But this is not a statistical number, that's just first a qualitative impression. Yes, it has to update data for your location but then it can operate, I think, something like one hour without connection. You had a question? Um, yeah, so have you guys taken into consideration of the day and the night? Yes, there are significant differences and they make the main uh, change day and night and then also the period of the year. So you will find periods of the year where there are in specific locations no accidents and then there is a two week or four week period where you have a lot of high accumulation of accidents and that's due to animals behavior and land use, agriculture. We have also for instance over years <coughs> changes because we have a rotation in crops and fruits um, which means if you have in the one year potatoes then the next year you may have corn or maize which changes also the behavior of the animals depending on the nutrition behavior. Um, how the assessment works? Yeah. So um, if we take some examples, the transfer learning of this fence and um, uh, uh, crash barrier detection with 5,000 images took something like two hours uh, with two GPUs. So we have Tesla GPUs inside the system in our high performance system. It took us two hours and the training of a data set with currently 100,000 um, animal accidents, wildlife vehicle collision, uh, took something like 30 seconds. But there we had prepared data and the data preparation to calculate all the data converted from vector to raster data, for instance rasterize everything, um, analyzing some other structures like land use from satellite data, or the preparatory work to get the basic data set, um, as you see it here, uh, is something like um, three days of processing uh, for several square kilometers. So it takes huge amounts of, of capacity uh, for the preparation of the data. For We don't work on sensors. It's just statistics. Is there a probability of an accident or no? Um, the warning is uh, for one hour period. So we take the statistics for one hour period for the one times 100 meter area where you're currently in. If there's a high probability for this one hour, you will receive a warning. And if there's no probability, then there will be nothing. But you mentioned an important point. Uh, we are currently in another project uh, with automotive industry and there is about sensor data integration. So the next step is we would like to use sensor data from automated cars or from autonomous vehicles. We are you working with cameras and working with LiDAR, radar sensors, that can detect animals. And the first question is, can we identify animals in these pictures and radar data? And second, can we derive from this data additional warning because what we have here 
is only a data set of accidents. What we don't have is a data set of areas at risk. Where was an animal next to the street or on the street, but the accident was avoided because the driver was cautious and was slow enough or braking early enough and avoided an accident, which means there's a difference between area at risk, a high risk, and on the other hand side, really the accident at the end. But what we would like to do, we have uh, now pre uh, prepared another application. Um, we would like to transfer this warning approach to autonomous vehicles. So currently we are with an automotive company in a consortium um, to feed this information, and not only for wildlife vehicles, but for general all types of accidents into a system, because what makes an experienced driver? An experienced driver is some person who has experienced some situation. It was dark, it was foggy, it was in autumn, it was a forest, street through a forest, and I nearly had an accident. And he will memorize this situation next time when he drives through a forest, it's foggy, and maybe it's autumn. And then he will be cautious and reduce speed. And we would like, we like, would like to take this piece um, of information from statistics, which means our accident statistics is something like a big, huge, very experienced driver who has already seen a lot of very bad situations crashes. And we would like to transfer this to autonomous driving, that an autonomous vehicle can behave like an experienced driver based on statistical or machine learning data and results. Um, we take the GPS for the system here from the GPS system of the smartphone. That's not a problem. Inside a car, all cars have already GPS integrated, so that's not a problem. We take the GPS data from the phone. Yeah, but in your car you have a plug, so you have your electricity on board. That's not a big issue. We did some surveys about usage behavior, and energy consumption was never an issue. Well, thank you for the interesting idea how to use machine learning, but I have uh, some practical question because you presented transfer learning approach to learn neural network. But what deep neural network do you use? Sorry, what? What neural network? What, neural network? Uh, what we used is this uh, Inception network, Inception 3. Um, it was used in a competition developed by Google. So it's a pre-trained network uh, based on TensorFlow. Tensor. It's based on TensorFlow library. And um, here you have 48 layers um, as, a, as a basic structure. It's not a convolutional, so it's not folded. Um, but it was the one that has won several competitions during the last years because it showed uh, the highest performance, the best performance in recognizing uh, images. Thank you, but uh, because of some <clears throat> low percent of uh, recognition, the question is resolution, just uh, 429, uh, 429. Yep. Maybe it's idea to increase such resolution? Yep. Uh, we are currently experimenting with different types of neural networks, pre-trained networks, mm -hmm. that showed in the competition lower results, mm -hmm. but uh, show uh, use higher results, higher resolutions for the images. There is one shortcoming. If you increase uh, the size of the images here as input data, mm -hmm you automatically increase the amount, the computing capacity you need to process the images. By just during the training process, during yes. the exploitation, it will not process. So it's, it's always the question about what can you do by increasing the uh, resolution. And uh, currently here we are working only with a restricted data set for one district. So 118 kilometers of street. In Bavaria we have a total street network of 290,000 um, kilometers of street, 
uh, which means this will in, uh, use a lot of uh, computing capacity if we feed not only during the training process, but in here, these millions of images for uh, object detection or image classification. So in this case, um, I mentioned already this water cooling system. We're also thinking about to use this one because here we are really significantly talking about uh, energy issues and costs. Interesting, maybe the training, the quality of training set is not enough because of some more personal preparation. Yes. Who is the teacher? The teacher? Yeah. Um, that's the problem with the pre classification. So, what we did was a manual pre classification. Uh, we used uh, 5,000 images that we classified on our own. So we had two students working on this data set to say fence, no fence, 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 no fence on the images. The quality of this data set is quite good with one restriction, visibility of the structures. So that's the main shortcoming. We cannot identify something in an image if it's not represented in the image. And that's not a shortcoming of machine learning. That's just a shortcoming of how to collect the basic data that gets fed into machine learning. So you, as you can see, it, long story short, it's always the full process chain of what data do you have, what can you derive out of the data, what is the underlying quality of the data, what is then as a result the quality of the data you result in further processes, what is the data you feed in, and what are the possibilities then for something like a post-processing, as we did it with GIS technology, geoinformation systems, to apply other rules that maybe a neural network has not available uh, and can be then rule-based filtering of the results. And I have a final question. What is the minimal distance that your system may detect animals? Um, with regard to um, crash barriers, we don't have any problems because even if you're on a highway um, and you have three or four lanes, then the resolution is absolutely sufficient to detect the crash barrier. So with crash barriers, we don't have a problem. Uh, with fences, you have seen the significant difference between right-hand side and left-hand side. And if you go into the geometry, the camera to the right, if you take um, edge of the road, maybe a gully, and then you have the fence. Then you have a distance of approximately minimum distance of two meters. If you go further on, then some fences, for instance, at highways, at German highways, can have distances up to 30 meters. And there exactly we have then the situation, if you go to the left-hand side of the road, then we have the left-hand side edge of the car, then we have something like five to six meters to the left-hand side edge of the road, again, two meters for the gully, so we are up to eight meters. And this was already a significant shortcoming, uh, which means the difference somewhere between two and eight meters, uh, there is opening the gap between I can still something in the image and I can't see. What I have to say is this change from um, image classification to object recognition increased the probability for identifying fences by almost 10 to 15 percent points percent for fences by just changing the machine learning paradigm. Maybe in the future you may apply your neural network to control by your car. Okay, the last question, please. Is this app free for us? App is free, you can download it. Um, you have just to spell it right because it's a Bavarian word, German dialect. It's called Wildwuidi, is the company and it's called Wildwarner. Wild, like wild, and Warner, E-R, like warn, warning, Wildwarner. And it's a Bavarian company, spin-off of the university. They received several prizes during the last years. Okay. We are the, we are the last question, please. <laughs> <laughs> How does access it provides an um, Can it also be classified as a Sorry, sorry. Since it gives an alert when, um, since your software gives an alert, can it also be classified as a real-time operating system? Uh, a real-time. A real-time. A real-time would be too challenging currently. You need a lot of parallelization, and there is no need for real-time analysis. 
Okay. So maybe one sample where we are currently working on, which will provide also a link. One minute only. Um, we used the same approach on archival materials. Uh, we stepped into one problem where we tried to find historical photo material inside historical photo archives. And we found out that you can't find nothing in such an archive, um, which inspired us to apply machine learning, object recognition, image classification, also on historical archives. We received a lot of positive feedback. So as you can see, there are a lot of domains where artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc. can be used and can be applied and they can be found in different domains. So for you, a broad future uh, to become software engineer, to develop such systems or maybe a specialist in data analytics and artificial intelligence. And if you're interested for some kind of an internship or some basis of our cooperation, then just let Mikola or me know uh, we quite often have international students on campus in my institute. Uh, we currently have a fellow, research fellow from Colombia, one from Spain, we have one from Nepal, um, we have um, researchers from Budapest, Hungary and from Czech Republic. So if you want to be the first Ukrainian or other nationality student doing an internship or work at my institute, then you're warmly welcome. Thank you for your attention, good luck for you all and hope to see you soon. <laughs>